Uh, this is a great start right now because we have a panel that's helping transform our cities, getting ready to discuss the convergence of technology, talent, capital, and leadership and future cities. Please join me in welcoming Carlos Jimenez, the mayor of Miami-Dade County, Peter Habeck Yule, the mayor of Uensa, Denmark, Francis Suarez, a little bit more local, the mayor of Miami, Alice Bravo, the director of transportation and public works for Miami-Dade County, Alvicia Longoria, the chief information security officer at FIU, Juan Carlos Bermudez, I love saying that name, mayor of the city of Doral, Sue Reinhold, senior director of sales and engineering at Hotwire Communications, and the moderator for today, Saif Ishuf. He's the vice president of engagement at Florida International University. A big round of applause. Thank you, Spiro. Good afternoon, everyone. I think I'm, yeah, the mic is on. Great. So we're really excited to have this conversation this afternoon. We've got a distinguished panel that if you didn't see the adventures, we have a urban leadership version of the Avengers. Uh, and um, what better time than now to have a conversation? You like that? Does that work? Does that look? No spoilers, right? No spoilers. OK. OK. I will get booted off the stage by one of our mayors or leaders here, so I will not do that. Uh, this afternoon, we're having a conversation about reimagining cities. And we're so fortunate that we have a runway of leaders that are coming from both the public sector, the private sector, as well as a few leaders that are coming to us with a global view towards this all-important topic. We're going to be channeling our discussion around a couple of different topics, including the role that innovation and technology plays. We're going to be talking a little bit about privacy. We're going to be talking about the role of sustainable development, as well as the role that mass transit and transportation plays as a driver in urban density. And so without further ado, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to let everyone know here we've got an hour. We've got a large panel. We've got a lot of, a lot of important uh, material that we want to get through. Uh, so I'm going to ask our panelists as we're moving forward to use a Twitter style 280 character type response modality because we, we want to ensure that we're getting as many perspectives as possible. So before we begin the panel, what we're going to do is I'm going to invite each and every one of our panelists to give a quick self-introduction of who they are and where they sit in our ecosystem. And I'm going to start all the way uh, to the far end of the table with our friend Susan Reinhold. Susan? Good afternoon. It's great to be here. My name is Sue Reinhold, and I'm with Hotwire. And one of the things that you'll find in the Twitter fashion is that the basis of reimagining any city is a fiber infrastructure. And that's something that I'm passionate about. And, uh, and the possibilities of a fiber infrastructure are just endless, regardless of what it is that you're talking about. When we're talking about more and more capacity that's needed, for artificial intelligence and everything else that smart cities can do. You need that fiber infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I'm Elbetiela Longoria, the Chief Information Security Officer at Florida International University. One big key to take away is security and privacy, it's something we have to talk about when we're talking about smart cities and reimagining it. Alice Bravo, Director of Transportation and Public Works for Miami-Dade County. Uh, transportation is really the key to opportunity in our community, whether it's access to schools, employment, or even healthcare. Uh, so we want to make our transportation system as efficient as possible so people can get to where they're going and have as much opportunity as possible. Thank you. Carlos Jimenez, I'm the mayor of Miami-Dade County. Is that 240 characters? That's, that's okay. less. You can keep going. We can retweet you on that. <laughs> Um, and as the mayor of Miami-Dade County, uh, we, I represent 2.8 million, 2.7 million people who live here in Miami-Dade County. We are one of the largest local governments in the United States, budget of uh, close to $8 billion, 28,000 employees. We're in, we're in charge of transportation. We also run the airport, the seaport. Um, and, um, and it's our job to uh, create a better quality of life, and we look to innovation. We look to technology, not only to provide jobs uh, here in Miami-Dade County, but also to provide the solutions 
for the problems that our citizens face each and every day. And so technology is going to be a, a bigger and bigger part of those solutions in the future, and that's why I'm here today. Thank you. My name is uh, Peter Rabe Juhl. I'm uh, mayor of uh, Odense. It's, it's uh, the third largest city in Denmark. We are about 204,000 inhabitants, and uh, we are close to, to Copenhagen. Um, I'm here at the Emerge Americas. As earlier today, I gave a speech about how my city made a transformation from a uh, traditional industrial city, and we have used uh, technology robotics, a special kind of robotics called collaborative robot, robots, we call them cobots, and we have built a very strong uh, ecosystem uh, uh, around uh, the cobots. And uh, I'm here for 204,000 uh, people and also for uh, 132 uh, robotic companies. I'm Francis Suarez. I'm the mayor of the city of Miami. Uh, I will incorporate by reference everything the mayor of Dade County said to double his character. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> amount. So now you got 500, and, I guess, four, four, what, 240 plus times two is what, 480? 480, 480 characters? Uh, no, I, I believe similarly to the mayor that uh, Miami has to be positioned as a worldwide leader in the tech ecosystem and that we are in a worldwide competition for capital, for ideas, for innovators. And I think Miami is very well positioned uh, in the future to capture a lot of all of those things. Uh, I'm Juan Carlos Bermudez. I'm the mayor of the city of Doral. We are one of the youngest cities in Miami-Dade County, 16 years at this time. And I was the first mayor, retired and came back. <laughs> so uh, that's a glutton for punishment, I guess, but that's the way it goes. But we've, I'm very proud of everything that we've done. Uh, we have some of the people that make it possible in the city of Doral. We are recognized uh, platinum level certification by the World Council on City Data. And uh, it really is uh, the something that's been very important for, for us from the beginning of incorporation. And much like Mayor Suarez and Mayor Jimenez mentioned, it's my belief that technology is critical to municipalities moving forward, not only to Miami-Dade County, but anywhere across the United States. It's the only way that elected officials can leverage, uh, really with declining budgets in some instances, uh, the services that we provide to our communities. Thank you all. So we're gonna jump right in and uh, the panel that we have here th this afternoon, Reimagining Cities, is so relevant at a conference like Emerge because when we think about it, the single greatest invention of human civilization is the city. And when we think about what's happening right now and the challenges that, l that stand ahead, it's really about how our cities are going to be reimagined to both channel the opportunities that are out there as well as to be able to confront some of the greatest challenges that we have. And when we, when we think that matrix through, we realize that mayors today, so I'm gonna start with our mayors and then we're gonna dig into some perspectives from some of our other panelists. Mayors are oftentimes positioned and placed in having to make very, very difficult public policy decisions that really stand at the crossroads of technology as well as matters of public concern. So my first question, and I'll open it up for whichever one of our mayors wants to answer first, is that how do mayors make better informed policy decisions about those issues that are at the nexus of technology and matters of the public interest? So what does that decision-making matrix look like when you're confronted with these difficult questions around how exponential technologies are confronting our urban landscape? Start. Well, you know, say if I got, I got to tell you, the mayors are on the front line of everything that happens. No offense to my good friends in, in, in Congress or in Tallahassee, but when something happens, we usually get the first call. I know my fellow mayors know that even if, when it's not our responsibility, we usually get the first call. I think that, uh, as I mentioned before, technology is critical not only because of, for example, in our case, Beyond our residents, we also have uh, uh, 14,000 plus businesses, many of them that are very large businesses, uh, Fortune 500 companies in our city. I think that the, the, the uh, critical role for a mayor, at least for me, is, is the metrics aspect of it. Um, beyond the technology that makes things easier, for, and I'll give you an example, a tag recognition program that we may have if there might be somebody coming to the commercial sector of the city to commit a crime. And that tag recognition program may pick up uh, a, ta a tag that shows that this is a group of people that have, are not coming here for good things. Having said that, you need to take all these metrics, and, uh, and Doral, I think everybody uh, knows that I'm uh, 
I believe in, in value-based budgeting. I believe in metrics. I, you need to measure things because you can't manage what you can't measure. And technology is critical for measuring. Now, the key for us as mayors, I think, becomes what do you measure, okay, and what you do with the actual statistics. And will you? I believe that if you use it to improve, which is really what the, the whole purpose is, you can make a much better uh, city. And as you mentioned before, Saif, the city is the core of government in this country. Uh, so I, I, would, I would leave you with this, at least for, with all this wonderful technology and with all the great progress we've made in the city of Doral, I believe the most effective portion of that for myself as a public policy maker is understanding those numbers and how I can use it to improve and come up with public policy that improves the day-to-day -day life of the businesses, the residents, and the visitors, and that it, whether it's traffic, whether it's uh, you know uh, code compliance. We're at the 280 and characters, JC. I'm cutting you off. That, no, but Francis told me I got his 240. Oh, you got he he yielded. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'll yield the Mayor whole thing. Guys want. So uh, to me, obviously, data is 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 a driver of decision making. But oftentimes in a city, you want to be an early adopter, and so I, I like to think of myself as innovative in terms of wanting to be an early adopter. And I can give you an example. We brought in a gunfire detection system called ShotSpotter in the city of Miami. It now covers 80% of the city. And we've reduced homicides by about 45% since I brought it to the city of Miami as a commissioner. As mayor, uh, my first year as mayor, we had a 51 year low in homicides. I'm 41, so it's the safest year in my lifetime to be a Miami. And this year, which is my second year as mayor, uh, we're about 50% below that 51 year low. So those are the data metrics that support the decision, the investment, because it was about a million dollars on, on our annual budget as a force multiplier. Uh, but you can't always rely on data when you're trying to be innovative. And so you have to try to change the culture of government, which oftentimes wants to see results before um, they take a risky, uh, what, what, what some would consider a risky investment. I appreciate you sharing that. And I, I definitely want to hear from, uh, we want to hear from, uh, our mayor friend from Denmark, as well as Mayor Jimenez on that. And when you think about people, one of the folks that I want to highlight who's here is, I think about an extraordinary leader in the county by the name of Margaret Brisbane, who works in the county IT department and the folks that uh, are there. And I think that that modality of thinking, what you mentioned, I know that happens in the city and folks like Mike Sarasti that are there at City of Miami, I know that the people part of it is really how mayoral leadership factors in. And we're going to hear a global perspective in a second from, uh, our, from Mayor Peter, but Mayor Jimenez? I look at, um, well, my approach to, uh, to technology and how technology helps us is, uh, it's pretty simple. I, I read a lot, um, I listen, and I, and I look at what is happening around the world, what, what are future trends in technology. And so I am not risk averse. Uh, I actually like change. And so my, my job as mayor is to push, push the organization into, into accepting that change is necessary and that we have to look at different ways to provide services to the people of Miami-Dade County. And so, uh, you know, the Shot Spotter program is a great example of that. And so I push my technology folks into how, how do, number one, what's the aspirational goal? The aspirational goal of, of any mayor should be that you want to make your city the best city in the world, period, bar none. You want to make your city the safest city in the world, bar none. You want to make your city the most livable city in the world. Technology has a place in all of it. Uh, technology, bringing technological companies here, making us a tech hub, then creates the, the jobs for the future that then ha you have then the salaries, et cetera, that you need in order to have a good quality of life. Technology in the future also will solve our problems of transportation. Transportation, traffic, that's the number one issue right now here facing us in Miami-Dade County. So I'm always looking not to what the, what the technologies of today are, but what are the future technologies and how fast can we implement those technologies. And as far as safety is concerned and how to make us a safe, I mean, the safest city, ShotSpotter is, a great, is, is, uh, is great for that. Analytics predictive, uh, predicting crime in, in the future also is, is very uh, important to us. Uh, how do we make sure that, you know, the bad people that are trying to do bad things here uh, know that if you want to do something bad, don't do it in Miami or Miami-Dade County because we're going to get you and we're going to catch you. 
Uh, so all of those things go into my thought of the use of technology, and it's really about improving the quality of life to our residents, making sure that they're safe, and giving them the opportunity to have a good quality of life through, through good paying jobs. Um, you really mentioned this idea, and I want to hear from Mayor Rayback about this, but how mayors have to become better informed policymakers, especially for these issues that are at the convergence of technology and the public interest. And for, for those of you who are here, our, our friends in the audience, in the EU, there's actually been uh, a higher degree of public policy thoughtfulness in thinking through things like data privacy. And many of you in the, in the room here that spend time in Europe would be familiar with GDPR and other types of public policy frameworks that have been put in place to ensure that there's a higher ownership as well as security that's ascribed to user data. And so, Mayor Rayback, you, you are, your city is a hub for robotics in Europe, and so how do you make those types of decisions that are at the nexus of technology and public interest? I appreciate the, the work of the European Union and the GDPR because uh, it's, <coughs> it's, a, it's difficult to implement. I think everyone who has been in contact with a European country for, for the last year have heard about it. But I think it's very important that we take security very serious because uh, the way the social media works, the way the digital revolution works, um, it, it's a, quite a revolution which creates a lot of value. But if people are not feeling sure about sharing data acting, uh, the trust will collapse. And without trust, it's difficult to, to, to use technology and people will feel that they are abused by technology. In, 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 in Odense, on, on, uh, uh, we would like to embrace uh, technology. So, uh, of course, legislation is very important, but we also want to educate our children in, uh, in, uh, in the skills of technology, but also understanding uh, technology so they can use it and avoid being uh, used by technology. So it's all about, it's also about technical skills and STEM uh, qualifications, but it's more a, a humanistic travel where you want to, to have control of technology and use technology to, to serve people and, and not the other way around. So you bring up a, a really important point, which is this idea of security and privacy. And uh, when we don't really think about it, but when we're using any public service, whether that's a transit card or we're paying our water and sewer bill, all of that is data which is extremely sensitive, which somewhere has to be stored. We have to make sure that appropriate privacy concerns are put in place and there's a policy regime behind it. And um, Helvi, uh, you play a really important role uh, at, at FIU as the chief information security officer that has to manage and ensure that whether it's student data, information that pertains to vendors, really the hundreds of thousands of different ways of very, very sensitive data points have to get managed. Uh, how, do you think how do you think through that in your role as CISO and how do you inform stakeholders that you are responsible for supporting around that? So I think it's very important to understand that we have to find a balance between convenience and privacy, right? Um, a lot of the technologies that we're talking about, a lot of the data gathering that we're all talking about here comes at a price. What, where are you putting that data? How are you safeguarding the data? And who could potentially get a hold of that data? And what could they do with that data? So it's very important for us to start thinking about, as we're thinking about all these new technologies, we want to be on the cutting edge. We have to think about the cybersecurity risks and the impacts that that can take. And how are we going to lay the foundation so that we can secure all that information that we're going to be collecting. Uh, you mentioned GDPR. California has a consumer um, law as well that came into effect in 2018 that is similar to GDPR, right? And we're going to have different states doing the same thing where you need to have acknowledgement that you're collecting the data. What are you doing with the data? You have to let consumers know how the data is going to be used, who you're going to share it with, right? So it's important for us to start thinking about this because citizens are going to be starting to ask these questions we need to be able to give them the answers. Can the data be de-identified? So if we're gonna hold it and we're gonna be retaining it, what does that data retention look like? How long are we gonna keep it for? Can it not have n names, addresses, certain information that we wanna keep private, right? So it's very challenging and one of the things we have to think about is what are the policies and the education that goes around that? 
we could put all the policies in place and we could tell, you know, have all the technology in place, but you also have the human element, which is also a big component, as well as in your infrastructure, your resources, as well as the community at large. They need to know what you're doing with the city and transparency is gonna be key. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Uh, it ultimately would appear for our leaders that are mayors and folks that are working to support public policy decision makers, as well as our friends in the private sector that uh, the famous quote by Benjamin Franklin who said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. He could be talking about an internet firewall uh, at this point. Uh, Alice, you, uh, I, I thought that would have been funnier. I mean, we can't get a, a single laugh. I mean, is it time for, all right. Uh, a little bit, a little bit, a little ask for a laugh is never bad. Uh, uh, so Alice, you uh, have a really robust charge here in our community uh, in, in and around transit. And uh, how do you think through these issues, both in your role and then in providing uh, uh, consultation and insight to the mayor, uh, members of the county commission uh, around these issues that are, are really every single day people, uh, stakeholders read about some new form of exponential technology, but you uh, have the charge of being an implementer and being able to assess what are those technologies that are out there and what do, what do facts on the ground look like? What does that decision-making matrix look like for you and your role leading the largest transit agency in our community? Well, definitely every decision that we make, uh, we're looking towards what will improve mobility in our community. Um, and we wanna help people save time and, and be able to access all the points of the county and also within the region. And, and when you look at the pace at which technology changes, that's probably the most challenging part. Um, so we work very closely with our IT group at, at the county and, and we look to see what other cities have done. And, and sometimes in that process, uh, you know, the technology is changing even more quickly than that. And, and certainly in, in the last four years, um, transportation as a whole has changed. Uh, infrastructure projects are traditionally planned on a 20 year horizon, and, and now everything seems to be changing on a one or two year horizon. So it, it, it's definitely challenging, um, but, but we look to see what others have done. We collaborate with, with national organizations, international organizations, and, and that, that gives us uh, better guidance what to do. U ultimately, we wanna get to a point where we're a mobility service provider instead of a, a transportation agency or a transit agency, and, and that means creating some type of trusted data warehouse where all the different modes are integrated either into a single app or a single account. Uh, if you're planning a trip from one point of the county to the other, you, you shouldn't have to get your Metro Dade account uh, to ride the Metro Rail and then your Uber account and then a bicycle rental account or et cetera. We, you want to plan that trip and have one charge and, and have that work out seamlessly between all those different entities. And, and at the end of the day, that's how we eliminate hurdles that maybe keep people using from keep people from using transit or public transportation. So we want to make it more convenient and, and easier to use. Thank you. Um, that seamlessness is a big part of it. We we think about the the choices we all have when we're using consumer facing technology. And uh, I want to transition for a second here because. Uh, we're fortunate that we have a leader like Susan with us who's coming from a great company like Hotwire. For those of you who've never visited Hotwire, uh, it's a technology company uh, that's right up the road uh, in Broward. And I, I wanna share a personal story. How many of you in the, in the crowd uh, have a young person in your life uh, that plays Fortnite? Okay, yeah, you can get a lot of people to raise their hands. Well, my house almost shut down uh, a couple of weeks ago because the, uh, the internet went down. And uh, when you think about it, in the world we live in today, I think that if you're under the age of 30, losing bandwidth is worse than having your water cut off. And, uh, but Mr. Mayor, I know we've got great water in our, in our community, so I'm not worried about that. Um, I think the question, which is really one of the biggest driving questions for those of us that are operating at the nexus of the public square, uh, the private sector, uh, in and around technology, is really around bandwidth and really thinking through uh, whether it's 5G, this question of uh, are we positioned at this moment to see public investments uh, in bandwidth um, that are informed by industry stakeholders to ensure that 
residents are getting what we need. Um, I think that uh, using the Fortnite example is one thing, but when we think about spatial computing, what our friends at Magic Leap right up the road are doing, uh, the possibilities for autonomous vehicles and other forms of technology that are going to need a lot more bandwidth. Uh, Susan, can you share some perspective for us? And then I want to jump right in. This is the part of the conversation that I, I want to drive as much uh, constructive turbulence as possible. So please. Absolutely. There is, nothing, there is no such thing as enough bandwidth at this point. That's why when you're talking about everything that all of the mayors talked about, whether it was um, uh, transportation or information, it's important to have that quickly. And there is nothing faster than the speed of light. So there is nothing better than a fiber optic infrastructure to get us that information. And not only a fiber optic infrastructure, a very resilient network that rides that fiber optic infrastructure. Because just like you said, losing bandwidth is worse than uh, lose, having the water shut off. Uh, you, can, you can go for a while without a shower, but my gosh, you can't, uh, you, you can't do anything without bandwidth. And, um, and that's why the resilience of the network is something that's so, so important. One of the things that we look at, and you look at when you're designing for any city or, uh, or enterprise, do you have a dual homed scenario? Because then, if something happens in one uh, part of the physical layer, you're going out in another direction. And something, something like that is so, so critical. And just as you said, whether it's uh, Fortnite or um, artificial intelligence or autonomous sy systems, the capacities are growing and growing and growing. And there when, you know, remember the day when we thought, you know, uh, you know, 100 meg was enough. My gosh, we're talking about one gig cities and 10 gig cities and even 100 gig cities. The, the, the potential is endless. But don't only think about that speed. Think also about the resiliency because that network design becomes so, so critical. And everything that all of the mayors talked about, that it's the ability to get it, the ability to get the information quickly, and the ability to act on that information. Um, I appreciate that perspective because uh, as somebody who has the fortune of working in our region's public research university, with students who are making uh, important decisions about their career options and the types of companies that they want to work in, we know that our economic development folks, when they're going out and they're seeking companies and making decisions about which region to make investments in and to hire in, one of the key metrics that they're looking at increasingly is around what is the type of fiber availability and bandwidth. And so uh, I see Mayor Jimenez nodding uh, intensively. So I would love to get your perspective on uh, how are you being guided in making investments in bandwidth and then measuring that against both resonant related needs as well as fielding perspectives from industry stakeholders. What does that look like? Because that is a complex uh, decision making frame to have to think through. Well, if we're going to become a uh, and continue to grow as a technology center, we need the bandwidth. We need the, the ability to communicate to and from uh, as quickly as we can. And so we want to be the first in the nation, say, to be 5G, though the entire county. Um, there, are, there are issues uh, uh, attached to it. Uh, and there are, there are permitting issues and there are regulatory issues that uh, we all, all, all the mayors here have, have uh, to take that in consideration. But um, you know, for me, it's always to be at the, at the forefront. To me, this community be, needs to be pushing the envelope of uh, technology and te technological um, capability. Uh, if we're to remain at the forefront of technological change. And so uh, bandwidth is very important. Connectivity is very important. The ability to get information to and from. Uh, for us, there are things that we want to do in the future that you can't do with the technology that we have today. So uh, it's, you know, I constantly, again, push our folks, get this out, get this out, move this forward because we want to be uh, at the forefront of technology. We want to be at the forefront of uh, innovation. We want to be at the forefront 
of, uh, of change, and more and more of that has to do with this interchange of information and how quickly you can get information back and forth. And so, yeah, we, uh, we're definitely, there are challenges associated with it. Uh, some things we may see as, as mayors, all right, uh, and it could be plain as date for us that we need to do this, there are neighborhood issues uh, because sometimes there, there's conflicting interests with neighborhood issues. So if we need to put a whole bunch of these little cells in uh, little different neighborhoods in order to increase our capability, let's say go to 5G, well, a lot of neighborhoods may not like those little cells all popping all over the place because that's not in, in my backyard. And so you have to somehow find a compromise to get us to where we want to go, but also keep in mind what uh, what's in the, what's also the, the some of the obstacles that you have to, to leap in order to get there. Mayor Suarez, I've heard you and I have had conversations about your thinking about bandwidth um, uh, and and the role that that has to play as a matter of public policy concern. What do those challenges look like, and how are you thinking that through in the city of Miami? I don't often get. Uh you know, compliments about our permitting process, but uh, I have to say that on uh, on on 5G, uh, you know, infrastructure, we are getting a lot of compliments, and that's because it's been a priority of my administration, uh, making sure that we provide the permits necessary to get the bandwidth infrastructure completed, so that we can be completely uh, 5G. But I think something that was said by the Hotwire representative is that um, Helventia, Helvi, Helvi, Helvi is that, uh, you know, it has to be resilient. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting is the modern day uh, campfire is, uh, uh, well, for me was during Irma, when I saw the elderly that were, uh, com you know, they were sort of convening around a, a, a surge protector with their cell phones. And I mean, these are, so this is not just something that affects kids that want to play Minecraft. This is something that actually affects all of our uh, population. Uh, and so, and we have a, a significant elderly population, which is fairly conversant with technology. So, uh, you know, we live in a content-based world, and uh, for us to continue to grow our tech economy, we have to continue to get content to be able to receive it, to be able to transfer it faster and faster. And so, whether it's 5G, like you said, 10G, 100G, um, our job uh, as public officials is to make it as easy as possible for our city to be innovative. And I think that that's great perspective because we know when we go into elections, we'll see people wearing different pins to say, I'm a healthcare voter, I'm an education voter. I would imagine from the moment we stand now and moving forward, we're probably going to wind up seeing folks who have pins that say something like, I'm a 5G voter and making decisions based upon that. And Mayor Bermudez, where you sit uh, in Doral, and I know it because you're adjacent to us as a neighbor of FIU, and we've got so many of our students and faculty and alumni that live there, Doral is really a critical hub city uh, in the western part of our county, and there's a lot of telecommuting that takes place and companies that are locating there for different reasons than, say, that are happening in other great parts of our city. How are you thinking that through because of the infrastructure challenges and opportunities for your city? Well, you know, we, we have the luxury in part of being a new city with uh, some possibilities of not necessarily having older technologies as predominant as other places. Having said that, we also have the necessity because there was nothing there to begin with when we began the city. We have about 775 uh, AI firms in the city alone. So this is not just an issue for our residents, but also for our businesses. And uh, what we try to do is work with the private sector because we believe that obviously the government can never do a better job than what the private sector can do. I mean, that's my philosophy and I think most of our council shares that. Our goal, however, has to be to have that uh, contact and connection with the private sector to make sure we reach out to our residents and to our businesses to make sure that you know the needed bandwidth is there. Now I will tell you, and we talked about the European standards, which obviously, and we also mentioned California, one of the problems that we have as mayors is that some of this legislation is not controlled by us. Mayor Jimenez correctly pointed out that unfortunately some of the new technology that's being rolled out by companies like Hotwire and others becomes a problem at the neighborhood level because of aesthetics and other things that they want the technology, but they don't want the technology to impact them directly the way they visually see things when they come out of their home. So. For us as mayors, the, the, the hardest part, I think, 
is to have our friends at the federal level, <clears throat> and you are correct, as Saif, that the United States needs to come up with a, a uniform standard. It makes no sense. Uh, and as a lawyer, I can tell you, every client, uh, Mayor Peter, I can tell you that every uh, client that has a website here that does business in Europe has to deal with your standards. And a lot of people don't even realize that. So uh, we, I think the most important thing is for the public and private sector to come together and moving forward on, on, on uh, whether it be bandwidth or other aspects of te technology. But I, but I do caution um, uh, everyone out there to understand that in local government, we don't work in a vacuum. We have legislation, both in Tallahassee and in Washington, that impacts us. And we have to deal with that reality. Um, you know, you, you brought something up which is really important, which is this idea that uh, some of the challenges are about uh, informing local stakeholders about what are going to be the trade-offs around technology and the services that they're seeking, while at the same time uh, thinking through, are there other hidden things that might come about as a result of those implementations? And um, I think it's also important, um, and we're going to talk about automation in a second, um, to think through uh, how other countries have really been on the forefront of making these types of public sector investments. And uh, Mayor Rayback, in, uh, in your country uh, and in many parts of Europe, uh, when you look at uh, the extent to which the network is lit up, these are cities that are fully wired and ready to go. It's not a mistake, as you said, that your city has 90 plus robotics companies that are, are headquartered there. That's a function of obviously an extraordinary talent pool, but also some of the public infrastructure investments that your city and also your regional government and your national government would have made. Um, how are you thinking through uh, even going further uh, in, in these types of bandwidth investments to make sure that your residents and the businesses that are making decisions there are continuing to, to choose your city as a place to do business and for residents to live in? The, the digital infrastructure is, is, is very important. Uh, Denmark is uh, one of the most digital, digital countries in the world. It's several years ago that both state and local government uh, stopped sending message by paper to, to people. Everything is digital. If you want to, to, to apply for kindergarten, public kindergarten, public schools, everything is, is digital. Uh, you're not able to receive a, a, a normal old school letter from the municipality. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's the, the digitalization is, is very deep. So, so of course, bandwidth is, uh, is very important and the di infrastructure is uh, very important. But luckily, uh, as a mayor, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a question for the national government and they luckily decided to implement 5G in Denmark. So, uh, so uh, I can just uh, uh, have the good part of it and, and building a robotic cluster and, and, and making a deeper digitization of, uh, of our municipality. So. So we're going to switch for a second. Thank you so much for that perspective. Um, and whenever you we're thinking about federal policy making and technology, I think that and how complex it is within our own country, uh, the absurdity of that divide, I like to reflect, uh, could be no better encapsulated than the recent Facebook hearings when a senator asked Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, how do they make money? And he incredulously looked at them and he said, Senator, we run ads. So we think about just the divide that exists between federal public policy making and exponential technologies. And we realize that mayors at a local level and folks who get to work in support, support roles and entrepreneurs don't have the luxury of living in uh, you know, such a grand divide and disconnect, if you will. Um, uh, Alice, uh, one of the elements of investments that cities and uh, functionalities within cities have to make is really around the usage of IoT sensors to be able to better inform decision making. And so I'd love for you to share some perspective uh, with us about how is it that uh, Miami-Dade Transit has been making some of those investments in IoT sensors? I know I've, I follow most everything that you all do, and I'm always able to. I know when I'm taking Metro Rail and Metro Mover and other forms of public transit, I can map my day out. But I know that behind the, behind the, the, the curtain, there's a lot more that's happening than, than just an app. Can you tell us about what those IoT-type uh, investments have been like for, for your agency? 
Well, um, something that, that the mayor has really led the charge on is our initiative to implement smart signals throughout the county. We're responsible for about 2,800 traffic signals, so don't blame me when you're stuck there. Um, but, but really, the, the idea is that, like I said, infrastructure projects take a long time. They're very expensive. What if with technology we could make our infrastructure more efficient and more effective and, and get more cars through each, each signal phase? Um, so with the, the smart signals, basically it's, it's replacing that computer that sits at every intersection and, and giving it eyes and ears in the means of sensors. And we're talking about detectors to see uh, in which direction cars are queuing up and also speed detectors to see the, the velocity on the corridor and, and with that information, you can make each intersection much more efficient and effective in terms of balancing out the delays. But, but with the speed sensors, you actually see the, the travel speed along the corridor, and now you can synchronize your signals better. Um, so, so that has two effects. Um, as you're going down that corridor and the signals are synchronized, you're hitting more green lights. That means less delays. Um, so the first corridor we attacked was, was US-1, and we've actually uh, gone out with it 300 intersections along 10 of the most congested corridors in Dade County. And, and while we do a procurement to, to really do this on the rest of our roadways. Um, but just on that US-1 corridor, uh, between the, the synchronization and the smart signals, uh, we've saved maybe uh, 15 minutes in that drive from Dade Land to downtown. Um, and, and in some instances, it, it, the savings is up to about 20%. Um, and what we've also done is reduce the hours that, that corridor is congested each day. So you're, if you're in the congestion, you're going through it much more quickly and you're not getting as much of that congestion. So now if you save 15 minutes on this corridor and 10 minutes on that corridor and, and we start extrapolating this throughout the county, you're, you're saving people hours, hours each week that they have more time available to to seek other opportunities or, or just spend time with their family. Um, now when you we want to take this to another level where with all this data, we want to be in the business where we could be predictive with the traffic signals. So that signal gets those detectors, but if, for example, if we know there is an accident at a certain interchange off of the Palmetto and therefore people are getting off at a different interchange, then we could flush out the green lights on that other corridor and, and deal with the traffic before it even builds up. So that's where we want to go. I really appreciate that perspective, and, and it's also great to know that we live in a community where those types of investments are being made, and it's also fu funny because we think about the technology and what it makes possible on one end, and as you we were talking, I could see Helvi, her expression kind of change because as a chief information security officer, she's thinking about, oh my God, all this data. And you know, the other day I was sending an in, uh, inspirational text to one of my cousins who started a new job, and I said, there are three forces that are always looking out for you. Whatever faith tradition you're a part of, your family, and Russian malware. So um, <laughs> you know, they're always watching you at any time, or insert any other uh, uh, state actor. So um, I, how does that bode with you, Helvi? Because you're hearing about more data, more data, uh, how do we balance that? What does that actually look like? Because when we think about smart cities, we also have to think about cities that are really resilient against uh, much more than just the ramifications of climate change. We also have to think that we are living in a very, very complex time uh, as it pertains to technology. And many of the professionals that are in this room have great companies that can help us think through a lot of that type of stuff in the public sector. So, Helvi? So I think it's great. Um, I'd love reducing time and traffic, that'd be awesome. But we do have to think about cyber attacks. The more devices we're deploying out, the more connected devices, there's more attack surface, right? So the chances of a cyber attack impacting these uh, traffic signals could be even greater. And the chaos that it could cause to our cities would even be very impactful, right? So along with deploying them and trying to get ahead of it and trying to make the smart cities, we need to think about how are we going to either it's not that it's not going to happen, but how are we going to mitigate a situation of a cyber attack, right? How are we going to be able to um, stop the havoc from causing a big problems? You know, we had the city of Atlanta that got hit with a big ransomware. It pretty much came to a halt. You're talking about medical, city, government, everything stopped, 
right? So how is that going to impact you? What does your business continuity and disaster recovery plan look like? Are you able to recover? Do you have redundancy where you can maybe, you know, the, the bigger the pipes get, the more attack surface you're giving them. It's more bandwidth that you're allowing, you know, maybe a denial of service attack to come through. So there's a lot of things we have to think about as we're innovating and we're thinking about all these new cool technologies to facilitate our lives and make our time and traffic a lot less. What are the implications and how we can mitigate it? Not I'm not saying not to do them, I'm saying how can we do them safely? What are the things we have to put in place? And they have to go together. We can't do one before the other. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that because that's really part of uh, mayors uh, and others are sitting at the nexus of the complexity on one end uh, when Alice is moving out, uh, out and about, she's going to be hearing from residents in her, in her role at Miami-Dade Transit about how do we get better and more robust services and how are we making technology investments. And then on the other end, uh, mayors have to think through how we balance that off against things like privacy and, and security. Um, and at the same time, uh, these decisions are not made uh, independent of the voice of our private sector. And uh, Hotwire is one of those companies in our region that's really leading the charge and thinking through and actually bringing to bear a lot of comprehensive solutions around uh, these types of technologies. And so Susan, what does that look like for you and your team as you all are sitting with public policy stakeholders and informing them about the investments that they can make uh, are also being uh, uh, accompanied with appropriate degrees of security uh, and that user data, which is really in this instance public sector user data, is being safeguarded in the right way. Very, very good question. And I see more and more data and more and more uh, information saying more fiber and a very, very solid fiber network. It's not a matter of whether there will be cybersecurity or distributed denial of service of DDoS attacks. It's just a matter of, of when, how much, and how well you're protected. And that's where the public-private partnership. Let teams that know how to construct and how to protect these networks partner because that becomes something that's just so so critical and um, and just as we were talking about the future proofing your city and fiber really does future proof and and when we talk about 5g or 10g not quite there <laughs> yet but um, and 5g is probably the technology that's uh, been most talked about uh, before it's actually really here meaning just the fifth generation wireless but though the fifth generation 5G depends upon millimeter wave technologies, which what that means is very, very dense and compact. So it relies on a fiber infrastructure to connect all of those 5G pods, if you will. And so I think about it in a physiological sense. The 5G pods are kind of like your capillaries, but your main artery is your fiber network. So in fact, that has to work together. Um, it's clear that we live in a region where these solutions are going to require a multitude of different sectors to come together. And uh, having elected leaders who understand uh, that the importance and the centrality of that connection point with the private sector, I think, is one of the region, reasons why our region is continuing to move forward in the way in which it has. Uh, and I think that residents are, are getting um, the best form of return in the, in, the, in the caliber of elected officials that we have. Um, and I want to turn, we've only got a few more minutes, and uh, I want to turn our attention to a subject that I think has relevance for all of us, and this is really the question of automation. And uh, automation um, manifests itself in a multitude of different forms, as many of the technologists in this room know, but I think that one of the elements of automation is really going to be about how it's going to impact our workforce. And um, we live at a time where uh, our economy is going through rapid, rapid changes. And uh, there isn't a day that goes by where we don't hear about a different uh, job on the occupational spectrum that's going to get decimated via automation. Um, and really, in some regards, it, it is increasingly beginning to feel uh, like a dystopic future. Um, the reality is, on, on the ground, uh, decisions have to be made by public sector leaders and thinking about 
um, how we are going to uh, forestall or how is it that we are going to ride out this disruptive wave around automation and how this is going to impact our workforce. So I'm curious because cities and local governments are themselves major, major uh, employers. And I know that whenever the stats come out as far as employment, um, so I'm curious to hear from some of the mayors. How are you thinking through building budgets that factor in automation uh, as it pertains to uh, the challenges and, and, and a future workforce. So automation and workforce of cities and how are we thinking through this and, and or is this a question that we need to maybe have a double click on as a community uh, to really have a higher sense around you know, what, does, what, do the, what does the data actually tell us? Automation, uh, without, a fact, without a doubt, will be a, a, an issue that we have to confront, um, and it'll be more and more, in, in, um, more, and more evident as we, as we move forward. I'll give you an example. Uh, the number one um, industry uh, of males in the United States is the transport industry. Somehow it's a driver, somewhere, somewhere in, in dealing with, with, with transport. And when, now we're talking about autonomous vehicles, autonomous trucks, uh, autonomous everything in terms of transportation. So what happens to all the, all those folks that are that are employed in in that particular field? You know, right now we have probably 15,000 uh, Uber and Lyft drivers in uh, in this town right now, and and yet I know that Uber and Lyft are are pursuing autonomous vehicle, autonomous vehicle technology, so sometime in the future when you call for an Uber, there won't be a driver attached to it. So what, and that's just one industry, all right, that you're looking at in terms of, of uh, automation. Number one, um, we have to embrace it, because we have to win that race. If you, if you think that somehow, well, we're gonna, we're gonna you know, basically stifle it here, then there are other communities that are gonna embrace it, and they're gonna get in, in front of us. And so it's inevitable, um, the future, uh, we'll, we will have more automation in the future, and then we have to find, do I have the solution for it? No, I don't. Uh, but I also have faith in, in the human spirit, and every time where, where something new has happened that's put something else in jeopardy, somehow we've, we've come out of it you know, pretty well. An example would be 1900, if you, there's, there's two great pictures, one 1900, uh, I believe 7th Avenue, New York. If you look at it, real close, there's a car in there. About 10 years later, 11 years later, there's another picture, same 7th Avenue, New York. If you look real close, um, there's a horse in there. And so this transformation from horses, a mode of transportation that we have for thousands of years to a car took like that, it transformed. But a new industry came out of that. And so I believe that uh, we are innovative creatures, and as we deal with automation, new industries will come out of automation that will help uh, you know, our, our population uh, be employed, employed with a, a different way, but somehow employed because I believe in, uh, in the innovative spirit of, of the human spirit. And, um, but I don't have the answers to all these questions about automation, but it's coming, and as mayors, we have to think about, okay, what are the impacts and how are we gonna deal with those impacts? So uh, I wanna hear a perspective from uh, what it's like uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. How are you all, Mayor Raybeck, in your city thinking about the forces of automation and how that's gonna impact uh, your workforce of both employees of the city as well as for folks that are working in the private and public sector outside of your city? Automation is eating a lot. Technology has disrupted many things in, in our world. Um, but I think it's very important that technology and new technology should be for the most of the people. And we know that the rapid development of technology sometimes will leave people behind. And if you are embracing technology, if you want to make business of, of earn fortunes of technology, you have to work in a concept where you, you, uh, you get the most of the people within the transformation. Um, in, in, in my city, we, we, we work with robotics, so of course many of our industrial companies have implemented robots uh, and have left some of the workers behind. Uh, we have invested uh, quite a huge amount of money in re-education 
industrial workers, so they will be able to, to, to manage robotics or, or, or have education so they can go work in other areas. So if we want to create stable uh, countries, uh, uh, stable uh, cities and communities, we have to always to remember that a majority of the people have to have a faith in the future that is a positive faith in the future, that they will be a part of the future. Else, technology, at the worst, will, will, will destabilize communities or countries because it will leave a, a great part of the people behind. So we have always to invest in, in the people who get a little bit behind every time a new technology is disrupting society. So education, education, education. Mayor Suarez, Mayor Bermudez. There's not much more to add from what the two mayors have said. I think we are increasingly in a knowledge-based economy where to compete you have to be adaptable and where technology is disrupting uh, things for the better and for the worse. Uh, we are now looking at our land use and the way we build, for example, parking garages to understand that in the future, they will, will have to be adaptively reused. And we already have uh, parking garages which are being converted into, um, you know, to office space. And so, uh, and even offices and office space is being uh, disrupted in the way that you co-locate office space. So, um, you know, you, you, I think as a mayor, our biggest responsibility, as, as Mayor Jimenez said, is we have to embrace it. It's coming, so you, you can't ignore it. And we have to find ways, uh, as, as Mayor was saying, uh, to, to make sure that our population is prepared for the constant changing uh, that comes with automation and, and the flexibility needed intellectually uh, to deal with what our economy is going to look like for our children and for our grandchildren. Mayor Bermudez? Yeah, it definitely will have an impact. I mean, something is, is uh, an autonomous uh, truck, which Mary Jimenez mentioned, you know, South Florida and Doral in particular, is at the forefront of the logistics industry. It's what helped make our community international trade. Once you take a good sector of that community out of being employed, we have to find uh, other ways for, for those individuals to be able to make a living. Uh, education is critical. We need to focus on what are the options once, uh, if there is, uh, technology has great impact on the logistics industry, for example, once these trucks get out in there. There's also other issues that come along with it, such as liability issues and other things that are, that, that, that become, but I do believe uh, that, um, you know, as Mary Jimenez said, we mayors have to be aspirational. Uh, and, and we also have to, rec the only thing that's permanent is change. And, and anybody who's been through an election knows that, you know. Um, the change is going to happen. There's nothing that we can do, nothing our residents can do, uh, whether we like it or not. Uh, but what we need to do, and working with educational institutions like FIU and our other major universities to make sure that our, the employees that do, uh, let's, let's call it, let's say fall through the cracks because that trade has been impacted, find another option and get retrained to come into the economy. Uh, we are at the center of the Americas in Miami-Dade County. And I can tell you, we're going to feel the change first before other parts of the United States. So please join me. Before we uh, actually, uh, I ask you to join me in giving them an applause, I would love to hear the favorite Ad Avenger character of every one of our panelists. So Susan, starting with you, we'll close out with that. Everybody gets a word. Come back, Mayor Bermudez. Well, I haven't seen the movie, and I haven't seen any news. My, my kids are a big Avenger fans. I've refused to watch every single one because I'm old school. Okay, so, so uh, a character. Choose a character. I know. We're coming back, Mayor Suarez. Yeah, the, I'll come back. I think okay, I know the one Okay, come back. Iron Man. Mayor Ray back. Across the pond. Across the pond. Yeah, who's... who's Actually, Odin's is the hometown of the fairy tale writer Hans Christian Andersen, so <laughs> I, I would love to choose your ugly duckling, but uh, that's <laughs> quite an action figure. <laughs> Mayor Jimenez? Character? Yeah. Captain America. Captain America. Oh, I like that. I want to be Captain Cafecito, I just want to say yeah. that. That's my, that's my goal in life. Gamora. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. Helvi, I know... You're an event. I know that you're a Marvel nerd. Come on. No? Nobody? All right. Susan? I have to say Iron Man. Yes. <laughs> yeah. My daughter's an Iron Man. I love that. So. I have to say Iron Man just because of the fact that he uses technology. Okay. Tony Stark, the original public private guy, That's wins. Right. We're reimagining cities. Please join me in giving our panelists a big round of applause. Thank you.